from the American College of Financial Services, it's time for Next Gen in 10. I'm Ross Riskin, chair of the Next Gen Advisory Task Force. And for the next 10 minutes, you'll be joined by our hosts and guests discussing topics relevant to up and coming financial advisors. Welcome everyone to Next Gen in 10. I'm Alana Phillips and here with me today I have Jordan Murray of Acord and Fong Wall Strategies and Lincoln Financial Advisors. Thanks for being here, Jordan. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Jordan, we've talked about next gen advisors. You're a next gen advisor. Only 7% of the advisor population is under 35, which is insane. And so many companies are still bringing on next gen advisors in these old industry ways. They're having people make 300 cold calls a day. They feel like the next gen advisors have to pay their dues, if you will. And these old models we're seeing have to really change. So your team has done an incredible job of really providing flexibility to the next gen advisors that you've brought onto your team. And I'm curious to hear from you because you guys have built these flexible chassis. What's sort of your perspective on these salaried advisor models, traditional advisor models, and how have you incorporated these options into your team? Before I I jump straight into that, I want to start with what the purpose of our staffing approach is. And our number one goal with people on our team is we don't want to lose people. Uh, It's generally known that it costs... You want to keep the people on your team? (laughs) It costs so much money to hire somebody and train somebody. It would break my heart if one of my people left. And it's not like we didn't do that before. It's not like we didn't burn people before and then they left before. We've learned from our mistakes. Our number one goal is not maximum revenue per person on our team. It is to pick the right people and then to not lose people. Because there was a study done and it basically costs about what somebody makes in a year to find the next person, to train them and get them back to even. And so I think a lot of our growth, we've done a lot of great things. I think in the last three or four years, a lot of smart things. I think one of the best things that we've done, we haven't lost hardly anybody. And so when we talk about these flexible models, it cannot be all about the money. People know when it's all about the money. And if you go, I'm not going to name names, but you go to one of those, I'm going to throw 10 people against the wall and see who sticks kind of businesses, do you really think that's going to build loyalty? Do you really think that that's going to help people stick around when things are difficult? I don't want to toot our horn, but we had one of the guys on our team who was an intern and he was, he was getting licensed and we were trying to figure out, he was taking a long time to take his series seven. He graduated from Cal. He's a smart guy. We had no question that he was going to pass the exam. And he and I were grabbing lunch and I said, Hey, what, what gives man? Why, why, why aren't you getting your series seven? Then what is taking so long? He says, well, it costs $700 to take the exam and I don't have $700. And I was like, you know, I didn't say it. I didn't want to make him feel bad. But I'm like, you don't have seven hundred dollars. You don't. He's not taking the exam not because he's not smart, but because he doesn't have the money. And so I went upstairs. I talked to my business partner. At the end of the day, we handed him an envelope with a thousand dollars in it because you, you can't expect people to pay their dues if they don't have the resources to do it. And I know when we gave him that money that that built real loyalty. That when things are hard, and they will be. We may be even going into a recession in the next couple of years, and he might have some lean years. He's going to look at us and go, maybe I could make a a quicker buck somewhere else, but I'm going to stick with these guys because these guys made sure that I made it. And, And that has to be the premise of your staffing model. And sometimes it's a salaried advisor. Our guy down in Fresno is a little skittish, and sometimes he doesn't like taking on a lot of risk. And we needed him and we, we appreciated what he brought to the table. And so we put together a model that worked for his priorities. At the same time, we recruited another advisor from another firm who's a lot more of a, of a hunter. And he wanted more upside. He wanted more ownership. He wanted more flexibility. We put together a model for that. And so when you're picking your firm, when you're picking your team as a young advisor, pick a team and a firm that knows how to be flexible. I think there's probably five different ways of affiliating with Lincoln or affiliating with one of our teams. And they're all a fit for different people. And so make sure that if one model isn't going to work for you, maybe the, the high salary, high bonus, low payout model doesn't work for you. Make sure that there's a way before you jump in with two feet into another firm, make sure there's a way that you can affiliate in a way that's a little bit closer aligned to your goals. 
Jordan, that's so awesome. I mean, the, the story about helping your advisor pay for his exam, and I know you guys are in the Bay Area, which is one of the most expensive places to live in the U.S., and so I'm sure he appreciated that support, and I know he's really successful now coming at the end of his first year here, and the flexibility in those models for advisors is so crucial, but I think the flip side of that is each of those next gen advisors and for those that are considering kind of these different options for them in the industry you have to know yourself and you have to know what you're good at uh, you know i think your own risk tolerance what the upside downside potential is in each of these opportunities and be able to articulate that and i know um jordan you and your team have done a great job of sort of drawing that out from your advisors but for those next gen advisors on the other end of the conversation, you have to know those things going in. Are you a little more risk averse? Are you more interested in that upside potential? Is it more important to you to have the joint work now? Is it more important for you to have support and resources later? And what does that look like? So um, Jordan, you've got all these different models and for different people. Is there ever an issue of you know, somebody pointing at somebody else on your team and going, why don't I have that guy or that gal's deal? No. And, and, and part of that is that in these different deals, I, I, first of all, that's a very valid question. I could see that happening and it's something we've discussed at length, but part of it is you got to make your models consistent. And so for instance, if any, if they're in the advisor based model, all the splits are the same, all the payouts are the same. And so if they bring business in, they get this much split. If they take our, our money and they move it somewhere else, this is what their split is. Everybody gets the same deal. And that is super important because that's a great way to burn all the loyalty you, you worked so hard to achieve is to make somebody feel like because of one thing or another, they get a, a lower payout than somebody else. And so we've got three guys on the advisor model and one guy on the salary model. You know, if we brought in another salaried advisor, we would just have to make sure that we paid that person the same, that we gave them the same bonus deal, which is why it's important to understand that these models, that they work, that, they're, that they are not necessarily profitable on day one, but they will lead to profitability. Because if you all constantly are, are repositioning and cutting your salary, that could cause issues as well. Yeah. So let me make sure I understand this, Jordan. So you have basically an advisor could come in at any of these models, a salaried advisor model, this more traditional commission and fee-based structure of an advisor, but they're able to move in, you know, if they're in the salaried model into this sort of career progression of then going into a more traditional model. Am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. So I'll, I'll use Steven as an example. And when you say anybody can come in, no, anybody can't come in. We have to be hiring you know, in our Fresno practice, we felt a salaried advisor would fit. I don't know that we would bring in a, well, we might actually in our, in our Bay Area practice. It kind of just depends on where the, the advisor is in their, in their career. But in terms of moving from one model to the next, yes. So we have, we've had Stephen on the uh, salaried based model for the last year and a half. He just got married this last weekend. He'll be moving on to the advisor based model. Uh, on April 1st. And so the way that's going to work is he spent a year and a half getting paid a salary and a bonus, but having no splits on the business that he generated. When he becomes an advisor, he's going to go down for a portion of the business that he's written over the last year and a half. Yes, we're going to take a profitability haircut when we do that because we paid him a salary and a bonus. And then now we're going to give him a portion of the revenue of the recurring revenue that he generated while he was a planner. But you know what? At the end of the day, we get a really loyal, really good financial planner in an office three hours from, from us. That seems like a pretty good deal to us. And at, we know that over the long run, he's going to be profitable. We have teaming agreements with all of these planners that stipulate that our clients will always remain our clients. So if he ever leaves, we get all the revenue of all the time he spent back. We view it as a pretty low risk deal. That's awesome. And again, as I think about the challenges of this next generation of advisors, having this sort of flexibility around their career path, around how they get paid, around how they're working with teams is so important. So thank you guys for doing that within your team and really basing it on that concept that people are the most valuable asset within your team and you'll do what it takes to keep the right people around. And hopefully our next gen advisors have learned a little bit about what they should come to the table thinking about. So thanks for sharing that, Jordan. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. 
For more episodes, visit our website at theamericancollege.edu slash podcasts. This has been Next Gen in 10, brought to you by the American College of Financial Services.